The E-2s, love them or hate them, they are perhaps one of the most controversial British 060 tank engines ever built. Likened to rail enthusiasts as DeLoreans are to car lovers, a sleek, beautiful design but riddled with design faults, and immortalized by pop culture as the basis of Thomas the Tank Engine. For years, rail enthusiasts have berated on the E2's design as not being all that really useful, and by the amount of hate they give them, it certainly seems like they're the most abhorred locomotive design ever built in Great Britain. Even more so than the Thompson Pacifics or the Leader locomotive. I'm not here to relay what people have already done and said about the E2, nor say that people are wrong about what they think of them. True the E2s had their faults and may not have been as good as they've been made out to be but perhaps we're giving them too much hate. When you look deeper into the engines themselves and the design flaws, they're not as numerous as one may think. In fact, there weren't actually that many of problems that could easily have been fixed. Join me as we dive deep into the design of the E2s, and perhaps you'll see, they're not as bad as we think. A quick history on the E2s. Ten were built by the London, Brighton and South Coast Railway between 1913 and 1916. The design was drafted by then Chief Mechanical Engineer of the LBSCR, Lawson B. Billington. The E2s were meant to be a replacement for earlier 060 designs, namely William Stroudley's famous E1 and A1 Terrier locomotives. They lasted in service for 50 years being good enough for the work they were given before withdrawal of the final class member in 1963. None have survived into preservation. The E2s were intended to serve as shunting engines in large dock and marshalling yards, as well as pulling short-distance goods trains and suburban trains around the London area. However, they proved largely unsuitable for the task of suburbans due to their small coal bunkers and ended up working around Southampton docks. Even that was a bit of a strain for the E2s, as their long wheelbase proved to be problematic on the dock railway's tight corners. This resulted in them losing out to the newer Southern Railway USA class dock tanks and BR class 07 diesel shunters, which proved to be much more suitable for the tight corners than the E2s. Some crew members that worked with the E2s even reported that if the regulator was too far open, the engines would spit molten coal right out the blast pipe straight from the firebox. The main reason why the later half of the E2s had extended side tanks in the first place was that they were super thirsty as well. Condensing gear was fitted on some engines in an effort to conserve water, but even that didn't help much. At high speeds, they were reported to be rough riders, the crews would be bounced around in the cab like peas in a frying pan. This was said to have been caused by an imbalance of size and weight from both the drive wheels and cylinders. The drivers were 4 feet, 6 inches in diameter, whilst the cylinders were 17.5 inches by 26. Braking was also a major issue on the E2s. Ever since the class was built, they were fitted with Westinghouse air brakes instead of the normal vacuum brake system. The E2s were fitted with vacuum brakes by 1923, but the older air braking system was kept on to work with older stock. It was commonly reported that the E2s would stop too soon and the resulting jerk would break couplings on coaches and wagons loose, causing breakaways. Oh no! These are the four major faults that people identify with the E2s. It's surprising the LBSCR and eventually Southern Railway and British Railways were able to put up with the E2s problems and keep them in operation for as long as possible. The reason why they were kept around for so long was because neither the LBSCR or Southern were in the financial position needed to properly address the problems on the E2s to make them better engines, or even to obtain suitable replacements for them till the arrival of the USA tanks in 1946. But looking deeper into the E2s problems, you may find that they actually wouldn't have been that too big to fix. And if they had been properly investigated, the E2s may have had more potential to work better and could have been able to properly go buffer to buffer with the other big four standard 060 tanks. Let's start by addressing the elephant on our list. The coal bunker. It's been commonly stated amongst enthusiasts that if you were able to enlarge the coal bunker, you'd be giving the E2 a larger fuel capacity and it could go longer distances. After looking into this further, I found that the coal bunker capacity on the E2s are actually just fine the way they were. 
The capacity of the coal bunkers on the E-2s was rated at 2.5 long tons, which believe it or not, is a quarter ton larger than the LMS Fowler 3Fs, otherwise known as Jinties. Even the Billington E-3s and E-4s had the same coal capacity at 2.5 long tons, yet they worked with suburbans and short-distance trains fine enough to be considered successful. Yes, shocking, I know. So then, if the E-2s had the same coal bunker capacity as the E-3s or E-4s when theirs worked for them just fine, and even had a slightly larger capacity than the Jinties, how come the E-2s were considered quote-unquote too small? When I had found this out, I had been wondering this conundrum myself. Then after some thinking, it hit me. Perhaps the problem itself lies not with the coal bunker, but rather in the boiler itself. The E2 boilers were known to be interchangeable with the same design used on the I2-442 tank engines, which were meant to be full-on suburban locomotives. The I2s were reported to be terrible steamers, just like their I1 predecessors, with crews commenting on the boiler design, saying it was adequate for shunting engines but nothing more. However, the I2-type boilers were also fitted to the E4s when D.E. Marsh rebuilt a few examples in 1909, and was said to be a relatively successful upgrade over the older design. Ironically, E232104 was actually rebuilt with a E4 boiler. I couldn't find any reports saying anything about it being successful, but given it was the same exact type of boiler as the originals with none of the other class rebuilt in this fashion as well, you could guess the boiler change didn't bring much difference in results. I'm no locomotive engineer, so I wouldn't know anything about the technical aspects of boilers, what causes them to consume fuel faster or slower, but if someone were able to point out the flaw in the type of boilers the E2s had that made them so quick to burn up fuel then a new boiler design could have been produced that made this much slower. Their steaming problems could have completely gone out the window. So we can count out the coal and water capacity issues as rather the fault lies with just the boiler itself. Sure you could probably extend the coal bunker back by about a foot or so, so that you won't need a trailing wheel to cope with the extra weight, or even extend them by height to match some J50s and austerity coal bunkers. But if you were able to fix the boiler, the coal and water capacity is just fine enough on its own. Again, the coal capacity the same exact size as on the E3s and E4s, and they did all right. Now for the long wheelbase, the second biggest problem with the E2s which prevented them from working tight corners that engines with shorter wheelbases could easily manage. Enthusiasts argue that if the E2s had shorter wheelbases, they could have done better as shunters. However, that would risk making them significantly weaker as the boiler would have to be shortened to fit the shorter wheelbase. In fact, you don't have to shrink the wheelbase at all. Instead, the fix lies with the middle drivers just simply weaken the flanges and treads, that should make them be able to negotiate tight curves much easier. You could blind them completely, but that would risk making the engine liable to derail if the middle driver is caught on the rails. So after weakening the drivers, we have now fixed two of the major problems the E2s faced, in regards to steaming and negotiating tight curves. Now on to the issue of rough riding. As previously stated, the rough riding was due to an imbalance of weight and size between the cylinders and drive wheels. Oddly enough, the E2's cylinders and wheels are similar in specification to the Jinties, with the Jinties having 4 feet 7 inches drivers and 18 by 26 in cylinder dimensions, as opposed to the E2's 4 feet 6 inches drivers and 17.5 by 26 in cylinders. And yet despite having nearly identical wheel and cylinder dimensions, and the Jinty's wheelbase being 6 inches longer than the E2's, the Jinty's in stark comparison were much smoother riders at high speeds, even able to reach speeds of 60 miles per hour. To fix this, we need to balance out the wheel and cylinder size so they can deliver the equal amount of weight needed to keep the E2 balanced when running at high speeds. One way you could go is giving the E2 new drive wheels and cylinders that match the ones on the Jinty. Another option is to give the E2's 18-inch cylinders as the E3's had. As far as I'm aware the E3's were smooth riders whilst having 4 feet 6 inches drivers, same as on the E2's. 
So perhaps this would be the cheaper option, instead of having to manufacture whole new drive wheels for the E2s as opposed to just simply transplanting cylinders over from the E3s. And now finally we're left with the Westinghouse air brake system. This isn't a major issue to fix with the E2s, as they worked symbiotically with vacuum braking which was also fitted on the locomotives between 1923 and 1924. The air brake system was simply kept in order to be compatible with older rolling stock which kept this system, and as time wore on this system would fall out of use. Again, as I am not a technical expert with locomotive design, I wouldn't know how to fix the issue of the air brake system being so quick to brake. Perhaps just be easier on the lever when working the system. Obviously! So there you have it. The biggest problems of the E2s reanalyzed and the best ways to fix them. So easy it wouldn't have been a big expense to actually fix all of them to make the E2s a better engine. Now I'm sure you're probably wondering, well if that's the case then why didn't they actually fix them? Well there's three reasons as to why. First off was that the Southern Railway was not in a financial position to rebuild every single Kenjin on their roster. Unlike the rest of the Big Four where spare no expense on locomotive technology was standard place, the Southern didn't have such financial resources to do whatever they wanted. This resulted in many pre-grouping designs that were meant to be withdrawn, ending up lasting in service till the end of steam on BR. Even the E2s and USA dock tanks had to work with the engines they were meant to replace, such as the D1s, E1s and LSWRB7s around Southampton docks. Plus the Southern was more focused on building up their electric system rather than improving their old steam designs, which could be easily sidelined once the electrification of the Southern system was complete. Had it not been for the Second World War throwing a wrench into the gears, this could have happened a lot sooner. Speaking of which, there's the third reason why. Because of the two world wars which both the US and Great Britain were caught right in the crosshairs of it all, railways like the Southern had to put whatever resources they could into fighting the war effort. Everything had to be run into the ground to keep things moving. Plans for upgrades or overhauls had to be put on the side and rebuilds put on the fast track to make sure they had plenty of engines to keep up with the increasing shipments of troops and ammunition abroad. Had the world wars not happened, things could have turned out very differently. Engines like the Thompson Pacifics may never have been built, and the E2s could have had the upgrades they needed to make them better engines. It was just unfortunate timing of their construction and working for a railway network with poor profits and ambitious visions of the future, that contributed to preventing the E2s from reaching the true potential. Despite all that however, they did the work they could do adequate enough, and worked well for shunting locomotives right up to the very end. That's all I will say on the E2s for now. Remember that these are just my own thoughts on them. You can continue to think about them however which way you like, a spawn of Satan in the form of an irredeemable locomotive design that belongs in the trash, or that it's a criminally misunderstood engine which faults are grossly blown out of proportion by train lovers. If you like this video, let me know in the comments down below and give me your thoughts on the points we discussed here. If we discussed all the topics correctly, or might have missed something or got it incorrect, do let me know. Would love to hear what you have to say, and if you might want to see more videos like this from me in future, be sure to also check out my other videos and subscribe and enable notifications for future uploads. Till next time, this is NickTrain123, and I'll see you somewhere down the tracks. Dry rails and smooth running.